We're good. Okay. Looks good. Great. So let everybody trickle on in. Welcome. Welcome. Give everyone a moment. <clears throat> All right, well, I'm going to jump on in because we have um, a lot to cover today. So welcome to Preservation North Carolina Shelter Series. I'm Julianne Patterson, and I'm PNC's Outreach Manager. Our Shelter Series is virtual programming that allows us to connect with preservationists across the state on a variety of topics. Several of our programs this year, including this one, um, focus on stories or themes that relate to a traveling exhibit we debuted earlier this year called We Built This that profiles Black architects and builders in North Carolina. The exhibit is currently at Historic Rosedale, the place that today's presentation is centered around. Um, and then Historic Rosedale is in Charlotte, and so the exhibit will be there through the middle of June. You can find out more information about the exhibit um, and future events like these shelter series on our website, preservationnc.org. The shelter series has always been free of charge, and we hope to keep it that way, but I wanted to extend a huge thank you to anyone who added a donation to their registration today. It's greatly appreciated and it really helps us keep these programs going. Because this is a webinar, we can't see or hear you, but uh, we know you're there. So thank you for coming. Um, and we still wanna answer your questions. So please ask questions at any time using the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I'll moderate all questions at the end of the presentation. And if we don't get to your question, um, I'll try my best to follow up with you directly at, after the program. And if you have any technical difficulties, um, please let me know by using the chat box and I'll do my best to help you. So today we're lucky to have a full panel of presenters joining us from four states who are all members of the African-American Legacy Committee at Historic Rosedale. This committee unites a variety of stakeholders, including board members, staff, interested volunteers, and descendants. The African American Legacy Project exists to promote the truthful, compassionate, and equitable presentation of the lives of the enslaved, emancipated, and their descendants connected to Rosedale. This goal is advanced through innovative research, inclusive exhibits, and programming, and the eventual construction of a, fa a facility to house all of these histories. Our panelists have a lot to cover, so they've elected to introduce themselves. And with that, I will hand things over to our moderator, Ronnie, to start things off. All right, thanks, Julianne. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen to get us started. Uh, share and there we go. Can everyone see that? Yep. Excellent. Well, thanks again for that intro, Julianne. Um, we are the African American Legacy Committee at Historic Rosedale. Um, we bring together six panelists today to give you um, different slices of uh, the project we're working on. So a little bit of an overview here. Um, we're gonna have one of our board members give an introduction to the site itself uh, and have our president or uh, rather chair of the African-American Legacy Committee give us an overview of the project at large. We'll talk a little bit about interpretive best practices at Rosedale, uh, how we're engaging with descendants, how we're connecting with place and how we aim to build a just and equitable future. So all of that to cover. We have six panelists here. Um, before I turn it over to the first panelist, uh, I wanna just go over a couple of key points with regards to the scope of the African-American legacy. So since becoming a museum back in the early 1990s, Historic Rosedale has always interpreted the lives and contributions of black individuals but research and programming continue to evolve to reflect best practices today. We know that Black individuals have always lived at historic Rosedale since its very beginning in 1815, and the first 50 years that was by force under legalized enslavement. We know that the next 150 years of our history, free Black laborers continue to work on historic Rosedale property. So because of this, we feel pre-emancipation and post-emancipation stories are equally important to sharing our history. These stories enable us to um, articulate instances of Black resistance and resilience, um, as well as acknowledging that the legacy of racial inequality that, began, that began with slavery continued long after legalized slavery had ended. Um, the AAL project also is kind of a, a compilation. It's a broader holistic approach that knits together informal efforts into one formal collective initiative with the goal of interpreting the past, 
present and future of African Americans connected to the site. Um, and lastly, we welcome your involvement. So at the very end of the presentation, we'll provide an email for you to get in touch um, if you're interested in, cont in contributing or collaborating. I'll turn it over to Janet Levy, who is a member of the Legacy Committee and also a member of our Board of Directors. Thanks, Ronnie. I'm Janet Levy, a member of the Board of Directors of Historic Rosedale Foundation and a retired faculty member in anthropology from UNC Charlotte. And I'll start today's webinar with a general introduction to Historic Rosedale. So Historic Rosedale is a nine acre property just northeast of Charlotte's center city. The main feature of the property is a Federalist style house completed in 1815 along what was then the Salisbury Road, now called North Tryon Street. It's the oldest frame house surviving in the city of Charlotte and one of the oldest surviving structures in all of Mecklenburg County. Also on the property are a reconstructed blacksmith shop, an administration building, and an open air pavilion for special events. Several acres are planted with outstanding gardens and the property also houses several treasure trees. The house was originally built, the, the next slide please. The house was originally built for Archibald Frew, who was Charlotte's tax collector at the time. Frew accumulated around 900 acres, but his family only lived on the property for a few years before he went bankrupt. The property then passed around 1819 to his brother-in-law, William Davidson, and eventually to William's daughter and son-in-law, Harriet and David Caldwell and their family who lived in the house during approximately 1833 until the time of the Civil War. And during this period, the property encompassed about 700 acres. It was a working farm. And in addition, David Caldwell practiced as a physician with his office in the house. Harriet Caldwell and three of her eight children died in 1844 to 1845. David Caldwell remarried in 1849 and then he died in 1861. And the property after some difficult periods eventually passed to another related line of the Davidson family and was occupied by Davidson descendants until the late 1980s. In the first half of the 20th century, Louise Hagee Davidson, whom you see here, developed the gardens, which today form an extraordinary green oasis along North Tryon Street. Her daughters, Mary Louise Davidson and Alice Davidson Abel were the last family members uh, to live in the house. In the 1980s, uh, without any direct descendants and foreseeing the need for preservation, the sisters led development of the historic Rosedale Foundation with the support of the Colonial Dames of Mecklenburg County, the Junior League of Charlotte, and the Historic Preservation Foundation of North Carolina, which is now known as Preservation North Carolina, our host. After a multi-year restoration, the house was open to the public in 1993. At the time of construction in the early 19th century, the house was known locally as Fru's Folly, presumably because of the elaborate architectural detailing for the region at that time. The house has a full stone built basement, which holds the kitchen, two main living levels and a third loft level. The exterior, as you can see, is symmetrical and has large windows, both of which are features of Palladian design of the early 19th century. The interior layout is not symmetrical, but it has a number of quite fancy neoclassical features. The interior wood paneling is hand painted with faux graining uh, to resemble mahogany. The mantles and cornices are decorated with typical neoclassical motifs, including fluted pilasters, urns and garlands, as you can see um, in the picture. And in one of the upstairs bedrooms, there, is rem there are remnants of imported French wallpaper preserved. During the Caldwell period prior to the Civil War, the property, the house, and the family were maintained by the forced laborers of approximately 30 enslaved people. And we know that Fru earlier owned enslaved people, and we assume that the actual construction of the house was accomplished through the work of enslaved people, including carpenters, stonemasons, brick masons, and blacksmiths, probably alongside some hired free white people as well. Staff and volunteers from the Mecklenburg Historical Association 
and from historic Rosedale over many years have conducted extensive research to learn more about the enslaved and we have a fair amount of information. For example, one family of enslaved people who used the name Caldwell, as was common at that period, included several generations of blacksmiths, some of whom were hired out for the profit of the white Caldwells. Uh, the fireplace in the central room of the house contains a set of andirons, probably created by Nat, the blacksmith founder of this lineage of craftsmen. Rosedale now has a replica blacksmith shop that allows us to interpret this aspect of the lives of the enslaved. As you might expect, the past two years, past two pandemic years have been complex and difficult for historic Rosedale. However, the pandemic did provide an opportunity to turn again to our responsibilities for expanding and improving interpretation of everyone who lived on or was affiliated with the property throughout its history. Specifically, within the past year, Historic Rosedale inaugurated the African American Legacy Program, about which you will hear more soon. The African American Legacy Committee at Historic Rosedale includes members of the staff, members of the board, interested community members, and descendants of the enslaved. So I'm now going to turn to Mrs. Barbara McRae Jackson, the chair of the African American Legacy Committee at Historic Rosedale will tell you more about this specific program. All right, Barbara. Barbara, you you're, mu you're muted. Julianne, are we able to unmute Barbara? I, all I can do is ask her to unmute. There we go, you got it. Sorry about that. Thank you, Janet. I acknowledge the ancestors and honor them. Good afternoon. I am Barbara McCray Jackson, a docent and a member of the board at Historic Rosedale. I serve now as chairman of the African American Legacy Project. COVID-19 and staff changes interrupted programs at Rosedale. The Rosedale board and staff used closed down time to conduct a self-examination and decided there was the need to invest time, energy, and resources for expanding and improving the interpretation of the enslaved at the site. Past mention of the enslaved was always a part of the general tours, a special tour dedicated to the discussion of life of the enslaved people was entitled Unheard Voices. And as you already heard, in 2008, a blacksmith shop was constructed. One had existed on, the, on Dr. Caldwell's property and was the additional source of income for the family. The Rosedale Board authorized the creation of the African American Legacy at Historic Rosedale. When I was asked to chair the committee, I thought it was very necessary to include descendants of persons who had been enslaved at Rosedale. The committee's first task was to write the rationale, which serves as the guide for our actions. We feel that museums and historic houses should not be mausoleums of the dead. Historic houses should be buildings in which we teach about the past. Ideas justifying slavery have been ingrained into American society and culture and segments of those ideas persist today. The desire of the enslaved was to be free. That was always their goal and their challenge. Our aim at Historic Rosedale is to inspire visitors to think deeply about the history of Charlotte, of North Carolina, and our nation, and to work toward repairing the emotional and social traumas that reverberate in our communities to the present day. We will assist in this challenge by making our interpretation of the enslaved population and their descendants equitable, truthful, and compassionate. 
Our thoughts then turned to erecting a building dedicated to the enslaved people. The many appendages to the main house, some dating back to 1890, had been damaged by Hurricane Hugo in 1989. There were no structures on the property where the enslaved population had lived. Those quarters have been lost to time and their descriptions are not known. The committee members have had many discussion about how the proposed structure should look. Ideas include a representation of a cabin that enslaved people had lived in in the 1800s, finding an authentic structure which would be moved to our, our site and restored, or maybe we would just have to build a cabin slash museum. While considering possibilities for a cabin, our focus also has been upon preserving the information we have accumulated about individuals from the 1800s to the present through diaries, ledgers, wills, newspapers, bill of sales, photographs, word of mouth, taped interviews, and genealogy. We introduced the African-American legacy at Historic Rosedale to the public in February of this year by illustrating skills used prior to, during, and after enslavement. The split oaks baskets you see were created at the end of the last century by 90-year-old Leon Berry. They displayed the craftsmanship he had learned from his previously enslaved grandfather. A mother and daughter team discussed construction of sweet grass baskets from the growing of the grasses through the weeding process. Also in display were pallets, cloth dolls, and quilts with varied patterns. The blacksmith shop was open and items from it were shown in the basement kitchen. A table was filled with foods a cook might prepare. Bricks were in a display case where one could see the fingerprints embedded in the red clay by the long forgotten person who had molded them. Currently on display at Historic Rosedale is the Preservation North Carolina exhibit, We Built This, Profiles of Black Architects and Builders in North Carolina. This exhibit gives us another opportunity to show visitors, particularly children, the skills of African American, craft, African -American craftsmen from 1800 to the present day. We have highlighted three Charlotte architects and builders. We hope the exhibit will stimulate interest in an area of study youth may not have considered before seeing this exhibit. Did you know that only 3% of practicing architects today are African-American? Historic Rosedale has been positively impacted by this project. New patrons have visited, new programs are under development, and new African-American descendants have joined us and have strengthened our mission. Ironically, one of the descendants is a builder and a preservationist. We acknowledge the ancestors and plan to honor them tangibly. You may learn now more about the evolution of our project from the following presenters. Cheryl Lambeth is first. Thank you, Barbara. I'm Sherilyn Lambeth. I'm the education of curator, uh, the curator education here at Historic Rosedale, and I'm also a longtime interpreter. I have been giving house tours here at Rosedale for almost six years. And in that capacity, I've had the opportunity to help develop and grow our interpretation and help it evolve and to be a contributor to shaping our narrative as it changes and grows. Rosedale has always been very fortunate in that we have included in our past interpretation stories of our African-American community, taken both from documentation and from family stories shared with us by the descendants. 
we have always made an effort to share the humanity of our African-American enslaved here at Rosedale and tell their stories as well as the stories of the freed African-Americans who worked here following emancipation. Our earliest docent manuals and our house tours included stories of many of those uh, African-Americans who lived here. And those include Nat Caldwell, who we know was an enslaved blacksmith here at the time of Dr. Caldwell in the mid to, uh, 1800s. It's believed Nat may have created these iron and irons in the fireplace in the great hall of our home. We also know about Nat's grandson, George Caldwell, who was born enslaved at Rosedale, but freed at emancipation, and who later became a skilled blacksmith himself. We also know about Miss Nancy, who was the head cook here at the time of Dr. Caldwell's residence. Family stories tell us that she was much loved by the family for her baked goods, and that at a time when owners engaged in the inhumane practice of putting their enslaved up for collateral against a business loan, Miss Nancy was never put up for collateral because the family did not want to run the risk of losing her. On the next slide, we have photos of another member of the enslaved, Miss Nancy's son, Jefferson Caldwell. Jefferson was born enslaved at Rosedale, and a family story tells us that he apparently saved the life of one of Dr. Caldwell's sons, his youngest son, Baxter, before the, during the Civil War. Freed after emancipation, Jefferson moved from Rosedale and managed his own farm for several years, but later returned to Rosedale as a hired hand land manager and eventually as valet to Baxter when Baxter suffered a stroke that crippled him. We have a codicil to Baxter's will showing where he left Jefferson, 40 acres of land to work as his own following Baxter's death in 1919, and have here the indenture showing where the land was ceded to Jeff and his wife Margaret from Baxter Caldwell. Another enslaved person that we know about at that time was a lady named Cherry, an elderly enslaved woman. Cherry had acted as a nanny to Dr. Caldwell's youngest wife, and his wife Harriet, as a young girl following the death of Harriet's mother. In 1845, an epidemic of a disease called erysipelas swept through Charlotte and killed a quarter of Mecklenburg County's population at that time. Dr. Caldwell was kept busy treating patients of it, and while he was not affected by the disease, Harriet and three of the eight Caldwell children caught the illness and all died within a year of each other. Before she passed away, Harriet wanted to make certain her girls especially were well cared for and sent for Cherry to come and care for them. According to family stories we have from both Caldwell descendants and Cherry's own descendants, both Harriet and the girls were very fond of Cherry. One story we've always presented in our interpretation regarding Cherry is that she apparently enjoyed smoking a pipe, similar to one seen here. Dr. Caldwell forbade smoking in the house. And according to the story, Cherry would build up a fire in the fireplace of the girls' room after tucking them into bed for the night, light her pipe, and blow the smoke up the chimney so that Dr. Caldwell would not know she'd been smoking in the house. We had this story confirmed for us just a few years ago by one of Cherry's descendants who said that exact same story had been passed down in his own family through the generations. Another African-American worker we know here at Rosedale was a man by the name of Albert Shands. Mr. Shands was not enslaved at Rosedale, but it's believed he may have been enslaved at another plantation in upstate South Carolina and came to Rosedale at the very end of the 1800s. He's said to be of gullet descent and was known to be a conjure man, well-versed in herbal lore and highly respected by the family and the community, he was the only non-member of Rosedale to be trusted with a key to the house. He was much uh, respected for miles around, and people often came to seek his advice and input on matters at hand. All of these were stories that we have long had and interpreted at Rosedale. And now, as we continue with our research and work on our AAL program, we are glad to be able to add not only to these existing stories, but to find and share stories of other enslaved and free members of the African American community at Rosedale. Some of the information we've recently uncovered and now share in our interpretation in our AAL program includes a list of some of the enslaved owned by Archibald Frew, the builder and first resident owner of Rosedale. Up until recently, we had very little information on Frew's enslaved. We just recently found notice of this bill of sale in the Mecklenburg County Court of Session. We also have uncovered documentation showing where Nat Caldwell was inducted as a member of Sugar Creek Presbyterian Church, a church still active in Charlotte, and one that was very closely connected to the Caldwell family. 
Dr. Caldwell had actually been an elder at this church. And we now have documents showing where Nat was inducted as a member, and it is believed he's buried in one of the burying grounds there at Sugar Creek. We also have this early 1900 census showing the location of one of George Caldwell's blacksmith shops in Charlotte. He had two shops, and we know one of them was located just a few miles up the street from Marysville. And on our next slide, we have photos of Alexander Price, a caretaker at the home who worked with the last members of the Davidson family to live here, Mary Louise and her sister Alice. In the next photo, we have a photo of Lori. We know who worked as a domestic here when the Davidson girls were young. We're continuing our research to try to find out more about Lori. At this point, we don't even know her last name, but uh, we're working to find out more about her and to be able to share more about her story and Mr. Price and the other African Americans that we know lived and worked at Rosedale. These are the interpretation practices we are following and we hope to continue to add to our wealth of knowledge and add those in our short stories as we share Rosedale with our visitors and our guests. And now I'll turn the presentation over to Mr. Kyle Smith, who will tell about engaging the descendants of those who are here at Rosedale. Good afternoon, all. Thank you, Cher. Thank you all once again for joining us here today. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Kyle Smith. I am a member of the African American Legacy Project and a descendant of once enslaved Nat, Anna Eccles, Jane Brown, and George Washington Caldwell Sr., all of Rosedale. So a little bit about my story and how we get to Rosedale. This journey started uh, 20 years ago on my 28th birthday, and it literally started as a question from one cousin to another, which was, how many of this, how many of us are there exactly? Now, as we counted, we realized that that number was 55. There were 55 first cousins on one side of our family from one grandmother. And as we added to this number, the next generation, the children of the first cousins, we climbed to 151. 55 grandchildren, 96 great grandchildren from one side of my family. We had our own small town. But unfortunately, we could not say that we all knew each other. And even worse, our children did not have relationships with each other as so many of us now adults did growing up. So this simple conversation sparked an interest in me that led to a chronicling of the various downlines of my four grandparents, and where possible, the downlines of their sibling. Now in this journey, I've been able to compile three different family lineage books, one for each of, or one for three of the four grandparents, with the first edition of the latest one at just under 500 pages of content. Now for anyone who does or has even tried their hand at family and ancestral, ancestral research, you know that the process of putting all this information together can be very interesting. There's the oral family history passed down from generation to generation. There's the documented family history, what you find in public records on birth and death certificates and in census records. There's the information that we know to be true. There is that which we believe is true, but do not really care to prove. And there is that which we are not really sure about and may never be able to prove or confirm. When you add DNA research to this process, it quickly once again becomes interesting, adds additional layers. I was, uh, I was at least five years into this work before I added any DNA to the process and any DNA to the story. Jumping again another 10 years after the first DNA test was taken, I was contacted by a not so distant DNA cousin for help flushing out our family connection. See, Ancestry.com showed that my cousin Harold's mother and I were either first or second cousins, which was interesting because neither of us knew anything about each other. And at that point, we both had been doing ancestral research for at least 15 or more years. Harold, I believe, was actually more than 20 at that point. But again, we couldn't see a connection based on the information that we had, based on the last names, the family stories, et cetera. In or around 2019, I get a random text message from my mother concerning a call that she received from her youngest sister, who had just had a conversation with their eldest sister, who at that point was 97 years old, and our family matriarch. And in this conversation, my eldest aunt recalls and shares the last name of my mother and her younger sister's father. And this last name is Knox. So Knox rings a bell for my DNA research. And as is the way of random information finding its way to you during this process, off to the races we go again. Going through my notes and my emails, I am brought back to my conversation with Harold and asking to confirm that the Knox of my mother and my aunt is a Knox of his family line. 
this is where the magic happens and we're able to see where the Knox last name fits into my family history and confirm my elder son's thoughts during a very lucid conversation. And so quite literally we say, nice to officially meet you cousin. Howard also shares with me that he has been able to trace back uh, one side of the Knox family line to Rosedale Plantation, the Knox line via the Caldwell line specifically, and specifically to our shared great great grandfather, George Washington Caldwell Sr son of once enslaved Jane and a white member of the Caldwell family, grandson of once enslaved and well-known and respected blacksmith Nat and his wife, Anna Eccles. Now that said, a situation that rarely ever happens for African-Americans also occurs. One, we now know the names of the, of the various family forebears that engaged in the enslavement of our ancestors. We even know a part of their history, which is recorded as far back as the early 1600s, 1600s in Ireland and in Scotland. But two, and more importantly, we now also know by name our once enslaved ancestors. But we know that this is a rare situation for American descendants of enslaved Blacks and Africans. Some of these descendants, some of us descendants, have already met and are committed to the process of potentially meeting, connecting, and reconnecting with other close and distant relatives. Two additional distant relatives are also on the African-American Legacy Committee. One cousin, Carlton Brown, is also presenting today. As a member of the African-American Legacy Committee, we are also engaged in building out a comprehensive family tree of the descendants of those once enslaved. And my personal hope is to build this tree out as an exhibit that, that will live on the Rosedale grounds and is able to be updated every five, 10 years or so to continue to show how the family is growing. Now, I've been taught uh, that the Europe of Nigeria say that in order to know oneself, you have to know at least seven ancestral generations by name. You have to be able to go back seven generations by name and even know those individual stories. Now we know that this is traditionally a mostly impossible task for African descendants in the diaspora due to the Holocaust of enslavement, but magical moments do happen. These connections are at once both personally liberating and powerfully apropos to the main goal and tenet of the AAL project. And this is the rehumanization of those once enslaved, and by extension, the rebuilding of their family lines. My personal role as a descendant working on the Rosedale AAL project is to uphold this moment and help the descendants of my fourth, my fourth great grandfather, Nat's six children, and help the descendants of my three times great grandmother, Jane's seven children, and help the descendants of my great great grandfather, George's 16 children to both know and uphold this moment to know the seven ancestral generations of themselves. Many Western Central African cultures believe that the history of a family is carried in the blood, it is carried in the DNA that is passed down from generation to generation. And the truth in this is very easy to see when you look at the family line. Our family line specifically includes politicians, well-known artists, big wealth, and even extreme poverty on both the white and black side of the bloodline. And here the artistic spirit of Nat of George and of little, Nat, of little Nat lives in us. It lives in us the DJs, the musicians, the Emmy Award winning producers, the architects and builders of their downline. We see that their entrepreneurial and educator spirit lives through the continued lineage of business owners and of educators. And in the spirit of the shared Yoruba value, our role as descended participants of the Rosedale African American Legacy Project is to shed light on to project and to continue to maintain the humanity of the enslaved, the once enslaved and the always free that stood on Rosedale land. We know that black history did not begin with our ancestors' enslavement. We must also change the unconsciously internalized narrative that the lives and families of the once enslaved ended with their emancipation. Thank you for your time today. And I now pass the presentation on to Ronald Truman who will speak next. All right, thanks, Kyle. Um, so my name is Ronnie Schumann. I am an associate professor at the University of North Texas, and my background is in human geography. So that's the lens I bring to this project. Um, I wanna tell you about one of the other efforts um, that's part of this um, uh, knitting together of informal efforts. It's called Unmapping Rosedale, and it was some of the research I did back in uh, 2014 to 2017 um, and really the inspiration came from first driving up to Rosedale in 2009. My first encounter with the site uh, was one that I was driving down North Tryon Street and seeing many of these uh, kinds of landscapes you see here in this slide, right? Used car dealerships, apartment buildings, 
textile mills, some restored, some not. This was 2009. And I remember pulling up to Rosedale and thinking to myself, what in the world is a plantation doing in the middle of all of this stuff, all of this city? And then I, of course, had to stop myself and say, wait a second, all of this grew up long after. Um, so this became a project about unmapping the layers, peeling back those layers of city cityscape to show that agricultural to industrial to urban uh, transition that Rosedale story is very much a part of and is connected to many of our histories. And this would not have been possible without uh, funding from the North Carolina Humanities Council and lots of help from uh, the folks over at Atkins Library at UNC Charlotte. So the project centered around three ideas that are key in um, geographic thought, place, space, and movement. Um, so the first task was really to understand uh, what, how far did the plantation encompass? What were its former boundaries? And then to ask this inclusive question, who has lived here? Whose life space intersects with the boundaries of the plantation? Further questions included um, really filling out this idea of movement. How did uh, descendants, how did folks come to arrive at Rosedale? What were those roads to Rosedale? What were the roads away from Rosedale? So where have descendants moved since then? What other places are tied to Rosedale's story? Um, a major vehicle for finding out about these connections was through oral histories. So they continue to be used um, in our efforts today. In terms of defining the former plantation boundaries, um, it was quite an effort, but uh, you know, the, the process was to first identify, transcribe, then transform, and plot in GIS lots of old deeds, maps, and surveys that were called from UNC Charlotte Special Collections and the Mecklenburg County Register of Deeds. Um, you, if you're not familiar with what a GIS is, a geographic information systems, think Google Maps, but you're able to actually plot features on a map, much like the uh, graphic you see there below. Um, we were able to identify lots more resources than we were able to actually plot on the map. So lots more work here to uh, tap into. Active mapping continues uh, with our site today as we learn more through our research uh, in the archives and through our oral histories. Um, we're continuously mapping churches, cemeteries, home sites, uh, workplaces that we find that are connected to our story and the stories of our African-American descendants at Rosedale. Um, we also are mapping present day reference points that might um, help to orient visitors to where they are in this uh, cityscape that has grown up around Rosedale. We found some interesting discoveries as part of this work. Uh, we learned that Rosedale was actually, uh, it had five parcels. It was not one continuous uh, property or tract of land. It was rather five tracts of land in the Sugar Creek neighborhood. The main uh, tract that includes the main house of Rosedale was 486 acres and did encompass most of present day Noda. Um, the picture at the upper right hand corner of your screen, if you're familiar with Charlotte, you're looking down North Davidson Street towards Uptown. The border of that main tract began at the edge of this apartment building or this condo building, the edge of YMCA property and went north and east almost as far as Sugar Creek Road. So that gives you a sense of the scale of just that main tract, one of the five. We learned that Dr. Caldwell had a gold mine and this connects us to the region's gold mining history. We also know that uh, Dr. Caldwell did send two of, two of his enslaved people, Mark and Ephraim, to work in the gold mines. We're not sure whether this was his personal gold mine or another. We uh, have also learned about family stories that are tied to the neighborhood around Rosedale and to the region. So some examples there, we have uh, Lester Henderson who lived on Creosote Road, which is in the vicinity of East Craighead Road today. That road no longer exists. He and his 36 children, yes, you're reading that correctly on the screen, worked as farm hands, farm laborers in the late 1800s at Rosedale. Albert Shands, who you see pictured here and who shared discussed, Earlier, we learned lived in Derrida uh, during the 1920s and 30s when he worked for Rosedale. So what these stories begin to do is um, not only build on our archives and begin to involve descendants in these oral histories, um, they enable us to build inclusive programs that really have relevance in the present day to Charlotteans who recognize these places that are very much a part of their own stories. 
So now that we've uh, made it into the present, I want to uh, push us into the future and turn things over to Carlton Brown. Unmute. Okay. <clears throat> I am Carlton Brown. I am Nat's James Isaac Lafayette's descendant. I those are my ancestors, and I am probably their wildest dream dream. To that I say, Ashe Ashe. That's the way West Africans worship God. For they were citizens of Africans enslaved as makers on the Rosedale Plantation. I've been truly blessed to be an architect and a maker and a remaker of buildings and communities. Um, in the course of the last 30 years, working here in the US, in West Africa, East Africa, Southern Africa, and Asia, I've come to recognize nine important principles for creating restorative human settlements. When we say restorative human settlements, we are creating those things that my African ancestors only wish they could be part of. Communities that reflect equity, they are resilient, and in today's terms, resilient to climate change. Over the time, we've developed nine fundamental principles, the most important one being the first one. First, do no harm, and Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a Kosa word, which means because you are. It collects us, it relates to our collective humanity in the sense that we are all one. And from that flow the rest of our principles value financial capital, human capital, environmental capital, incorporate salute returns on each one. Use, <clears throat> use more waste than we create, include more people than we exclude. Um, don't export capital from communities of underserved people, but develop people. Create places that enable beneficial human activity. Um, create people, places where people can be self-actualized, you know, and that would be the dream of our ancestors, that we and they and their descendants could be self-actualized. Go to the next slide, please. I'm going to tell you a little bit about a community we started working in in Harlem, which is a disinvested community in Upper Manhattan. We started working there in 1988, maybe 1990, at a time when there was vacant land, um, vacant buildings, um, hopelessness among people. There had been an urban renewal project called Urban Millbank Frawley that started in 1968. And they tore down buildings, left vacant land, um, high crime, concentrated poverty, and people thought that this was going to be the way it would be in perpetuity. Um, what we found, we decided we could change. Um, next slide, please. So what we did, and our company is called Direct Invest Development, we created those sort of fundamental roots for creating restorative human settlement. One of the things we did is we developed about 800 new condominiums adjacent to public housing, and we made them mixed income developments. They are those two pictures on the top left. Uh, they were the first multifamily green buildings, the first ones affordable. They were a place where we worked on creating community where there had been a lost sense of community. People that had formerly lived in housing directly behind here were able to purchase their own home. At the same time where we had former residents of public housing, we had teachers, police officers, UN diplomats, attorneys, lawyers, doctors, elected officials, and a whole range of people that said, yes, we can community in a new way. So what we did is we did things that we call creative placemaking. Um, if you look at the picture down on the right, we, you'll see 
that in the lobby, we commission artists. And a number of those artists, including that one whose wall hangings there later became very famous. L and Nancy that for maybe $150,000. Five years later, it was appraised at $4 million because he became one of the most notable contemporary African artists um, in the world. When you look at the picture on the left, that's really at the bottom left. That's probably not what you think of when you say affordable housing. What we did is we rethought we pioneered a way of creating affordable housing that looks and feels and functions like market rate luxury housing. Our notion was that we are all collect connected through our humanity and we should all have the same things. Um, next slide, please. So part of what we do is when we say um, include more people than we exclude. When we create opportunities for people to be self-actualized, in this community in Harlem, when we arrived there, for children that lived in public housing and went to public school, someone had written their future on the wall. You're going to be a You're going to drop out. You're going to go to prison. You're going to die of drug overdose, et cetera. So what we wanted to do was change that. So we put in a nonprofit group called Street Squash and we partnered with Columbia University. We built eight regulations um, squash courts, uh, four classrooms and a library and Columbia University squash team could practice there on the condition they mentored and tutored children in the neighborhood. Every year, three since 2008 when this opened, um, every year, 300 children have finished this program. They start in sixth grade. Um, every year, 98% of those graduate from high school and go on to college, and about 90% of them graduate from college within five years. This is not the expectation for low-income families in Harlem. So it's a place where we gather and we change people's attitudes and we change their future. We gather, you know, one of the things when you're building diverse communities where people are different incomes, different races, different orientations, et cetera, you have to create, that, create those places, what we like to call neutral zones. So one of the things we did in this building is we created a neutral zone called My Image Studios. And it was a place that was used for live performance. It was a restaurant and bar. That's the center picture at the low in the middle. Um, we showed movies there. We did live performance of um, artists. Um, we had um, lectures there. We had debates there for public office. We did recordings. There were films that were made there. There was music that was made there. And it was a space that was priced at a way that they always had access to it so they could build community by gathering and telling their stories in their own authentic voice. So if we want to create places where people can be self-actualized, create equity, it's a journey. It says do things differently. And so that's the way we have continued to build community throughout all our projects. And next slide. And I just wanted to doorbell. Oop, I think we just want to plug one last time the uh, we built this exhibit as that connects to your work personally Carlton and you're part of that long line of builders and makers connected to our site so we'll round it out there and open the floor for any questions thank you Yes, thank you. Thank you all. And I, I do love how you can made that connection at the end there, Ronnie, because um, I was just thinking, yeah, ha, like the stories from um, from where we started to what uh, what's being done in the future is great. Um, so just a reminder to everybody, you can put questions in the Q&A box um, and I'll also take them in the chat. Um, but I figured I would start things off just because I'm so curious. I know, um, Kyle, you had you did all this research and you presented that, which people in the chat are just so impressed by. Um, but what I'm just curious, like, what was that first introduction to Rosedale? Like, who 
did you connect with Rosedale? Did someone from Rosedale connect with you or what, what did that look like? And what did that look like with your other family members? No. So, um, again, so this, this, there's this place where the family story that's told doesn't always match up with, with what actually is. Um, so once I got this information and spoke to Harold and we went back and forth for a couple of years and I shared it with my mother um, and, and with my aunt, because my aunt is still in Charlotte, I still have family in Charlotte. The goal was always that the next time that I come to Charlotte to pick up family members. And you know, like we just, we go, we see, same as Ronnie said, like no one knew that the house was kind of there, kind of pushed off, you know, pushed off of the road. Um, and so my Aunt Lorraine is the only one that's able to attend with me and you were kind of walking around the grounds and this is during COVID. So there are no tours that are being given. Um, and now I can't remember who it was that came out. It was like, you know, welcome to Rosedale. You know, is this your first time coming here? And I was like, yeah. It's like, how did you find out about it? And I was like, well, you know, well, George is my great, great grandfather and kind of time stops for everyone on Rosedale. <laughs> As now everyone is coming out, like, no, you know, we need to talk and let's have information, you know. So they, um, uh, it was a very welcoming in, environment. Um, so, of course, it was uh, emotionally heavy. And it was just kind of interesting to be standing at the same place where descendants of yours um, once lived or were that no one knew their name or no one knew that they were, that they were related to you. So that was... I think I answered your question. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 fascinating. And I'm curious, Carlton, have you been to the site before or have plans to? Uh, yes, I have been to the site once. Um, it was it was a little, well, I guess a number of years ago, my um, daughter gave me an ancestry.com, you know, membership. And I just, you know, I'd never, I, I, I knew I was born in North Carolina and my parents were born there in Charlotte. And I knew I had African ancestors that were slaves someplace in North Carolina, but there were just no family records beyond my father because my father's father, Lafayette, who was born as a slave on, in like 1862 or 63, just before emancipation, um, he died when my father was like one or two years old. So my father never really knew his father. And so it just sort of got cut off there. And so when we did this ancestry thing, you know, it said, well, who do you know? I'm like, well, I know my father, obviously. And I knew my father's father's name was Lafayette. Then all this stuff started popping up. I'm like, oh, what is that? And somehow Rosedale came up. And then someone from Rosedale actually contacted me in the, the, uh, in the um, ancestry note thing. And I'm like, oh, well, I'm going to North Carolina to uh, a cousin's wedding. So well, I'm going to this wedding. Let me go check it out. And so when I got there, very much like Kyle, someone said, oh, you're Carlton. You're one of the descendants. And they told me the whole story. And I learned a lot more then, but where I really found out about Rosedale was through Kyle, because Kyle, again, contacted me through Ancestry, and he says, hey, cuss. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I don't know who you are. <laughs> why, why are you doing this? I'm like, um, and after we actually talked, you know, God, it was, it was bizarre, our relatives, but what was really even more bizarre I live in Brooklyn, and at the time he contacted me, he had only a few weeks moved out of Brooklyn, probably a 10-minute walk, four or five blocks from where I live in Brooklyn. And so that was like really bizarre, which I just give that up to the ancestors that, you know, they got something going on that we don't even know about, you know, so wow. short story. So we have a question from um, John McPherson for Ronnie, and he wants to know, is your um, research in the GIS map, is that up online anywhere or where is that? It, uh, it is not online yet. We have been kind of talking about how we want to make that public. Um, we have kind of, it's a living geo database right now. It's being housed in ArcGIS Pro um, on my own server, but, but yeah, I know we are planning to use some of that in, um, 
posters and displays that will form the basis of some of our upcoming exhibits. So look for that to gradually be made public. And of course, being a living uh, geodatabase, it's, uh, it's constantly being added to. And yeah, just the whole concept of like unmapping Rosedale, I think is so such a unique way to think of these historic sites and how they change over time. But I love um, too that you're tying in descendants and where they've kind of traveled. Like, so will you kind of have um, ties to where descendants are now living? Just, I mean, I, I imagine that wouldn't be like an external thing, but is that something that Rosedale internally is planning on? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and it's funny you mentioned that, like there are so many even stories in the oral history where, you know, I'm just so attuned to that idea of movement, migration, and that comes up in the stories. I remember a story that Harold um, told me about, you know, taking this big trip. He grew up in, in New York City and taking this big trip down south to visit the cousins in North Carolina and all the places of various cousins that they stopped along the way. Um, so yeah, those are the kinds of features we're wanting to add. Um, so yeah, e eventually, yes, we do hope to tie that in and bring that forward to the present as much as possible. Great, <clears throat> and I see um, Emmanuel Allen has raised uh, their hand and I'm just gonna, if you can put your comment in the chat or in the uh, Q&A box, if you have a question, um, love to take it, take it that way. Um, so a question that I have, maybe it's for Sharon, maybe it's for everybody, but what has the research process been like trying to find out more um, of the people that live there whose names you may not have known a year ago, two years ago, um, and we still don't know. Well, and I can certainly say from the work we've been doing here at Rosedale, though we have been digging deep into records that we've come across. Uh, we've got several folks connected with Rosedale who work at University at Charlotte, University of North Carolina at Charlotte, where there's a special collections of the Caldwell and Davidson papers. And so we have been uh, delving through those to try to learn more about the families that were here. Uh, we've also been engaging, as uh, both Carlton and Kyle were saying, with the descendants. We've been very fortunate to catch up with them and hear their family stories and learn from them about their own ancestors that lived here at Rosedale. And we've actually been doing some legwork. We are planning to go out and do a, a cemetery excursion one day soon to try to investigate some of the enslaved that may have been buried in some of the cemeteries around here in Charlotte. So, you know, it's definitely, as Ronnie said, it's ongoing research. We are constantly digging up new information and trying to add that in on the uh, interpretation that we do and these displays and exhibits that we do. And, and while I'm here, I want to do one more quick plug for the We Built This Exhibit here at Rosedale. We're very excited to have that here. Uh, there, is a small, there is a fee to see the exhibit itself, but we do have several free events going along with that. And I would love to encourage people to look at our website and see what we have coming up in conjunction with the exhibit. Uh, Julianne, I, I also wanna say that um, the Mecklenburg Historical Association, which is an interest group that's been established in the region for a long time, quite a few years ago, back in the 90s, um, started some of the research on, on the enslaved and um, provided it to, to Rosedale. So the, the history of, of uh, research, it, 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 it started earlier than I expected to, to learn when I heard of that at first. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, I, there's definitely, research is growing and expanding at a rapid pace these days, which we're really excited about. And uh, I mean, just in researching for the We Built This exhibit, I mean, we're all in, everybody at PNC, we're ingrained in history and historic building every day. And we were learning stuff every single day, um, which is really exciting. Um, and at the same time, you recognize how many people haven't been recognized and acknowledged in history. So it's definitely a humbling experience as well as exciting that people are finally getting a little bit of the recognition that um, they should have gotten a long time ago. Um, I see a lot of people in the in the chat have asked me to send them the recording directly, and I will definitely do that. Um, I know we're getting up to the, the end of this presentation, uh, so I don't know if anybody has any final comments. I've really enjoyed this, and I know just from uh, the comments that we've received, a lot of other people have as well. But any any final comments from anyone on the panel? Just an, an overall thank you to you, Julianne, for having us and for the work that you all are doing to really promote um, inclusive interpretation. That's what, what we aim to do here.
Well, thank you, because I was just going to say the same thing to you all and just say thank you so much for inviting PNC and the exhibit into Rosedale, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to kind of broadcast all the work that you've been doing um, out to everybody, and thank you so much for all the work that you are doing. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you. All right, so long. Take care. <laughs>